Okay, you've heard the numbers and the analysis that it produces. Um, we will open up to the floor for questions and comments uh, shortly. Uh, since his name's been taken in vain a couple of times, we'll give Frank Vargo the first question so he can crow. Um, but uh, first, we want to get some expert and deeply experienced uh, reflections on all this from our former high officials and continued active extremely active participants in the trade policy process. So let me turn first to Carla Hills, then to Stu Eisenstadt, then to Clayton Yider, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Carla. My view is that uh, the team here, thank you, Fred. The team here has done a superlative job in providing a path through the thicket. I think that completing the Doha round is extremely important. I think the gains that are on the table are difficult in a political sense, not in an economic sense. I belong to the school of thought that says, take what you can, when you can, and keep working at it, and maybe we can get more later. But this team has come up with a mechanism of additions that could be done, and could be done politically but it's going to take some salesmanship. I mean, when you say the United States should reduce its farm subsidies and deal with cotton, that's a political issue. I don't mind saying on the record that I am hugely embarrassed for my country over the cotton issue. It grieves me significantly that we lose a case in the WTO, yet we believe in rule of law. And then we bribe Brazil to look the other way and to form a something less than what true abiding by the rule of law would be. And in so doing, we cut off the four poorest countries in Western Africa. And I ask you, is that America as you want it to be? It's also that we would have to eliminate zeroing. We've lost that case, not once, but multiple times. It's time that we believe in rule of law and that we top off our offers for poor countries, I think is part of why we started this round. You know, uh, I looked up this morning, because I often use this, the uh, figure, of uh, the difference of trade outlook for Bangladesh, a country of 165 million poor people. And uh, we buy from them about $3.5 billion worth of goods. Three and a half billion. We uh, tax those goods with our duties, uh, 560 million. Now, if from France, a rich country, we buy 34 billion, 10 times more in goods from them. And our bill for them for uh, uh, the uh, tariffs is just half of Bangladesh, 280 million dollars. Now, if you were representing a poor country, you would think, I didn't come in on the trade regime with a level playing field. And our politicians are always talking about a level playing field. But the things that Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Indonesia make are things that have not had tariffs reduced. You know, we have a 49% tariff on cheap tennis shoes. We don't make cheap tennis shoes, so we're not saving any jobs. But I can tell you, we're hurting the poorest countries of the world. And I think that has a, an element of, of selling to Americans. They simply don't know those facts. So I'm very much in the belief that we should get this done on the grounds that we will win something, not a great big package. The developing countries will be moved ahead. It will be more fair, not perfect. And there's another reason that I, uh, I think is extraordinarily important, and that is the WTO itself. The World Trade Organization, with its dispute settlement mechanism, is the most valuable institution in the world today, in my personal view. It's the only institution that has a dispute settlement mechanism that really works. When we lose a case 
at least in the old days, to Costa Rica over socks, we didn't, we didn't abide by the ruling because we were afraid of the retaliation that Costa Rica might bring. Instead, we abided by the ruling because we believed in the system, the rule of law. And without that rule of law, it's the law of the jungle. And because we are globalized, the jungle is growing unless we move our trade system forward. So when uh, Gary and Jeff can share with our government a mechanism, a pathway for how to get this done, and we can all tell the American people why this is important, I think they've done a huge service, and I compliment them and their team. Thank you, Carla. Stu. I want to comment more broadly, but I do want to stress the point that Carla made. Uh, because I was involved in, in one of the most sensitive cases that we lost twice, uh, which was the Foreign S Sales Corporation uh, incentive, the FISC. Um, when I was Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, I was asked to try to correct the loss without uh, losing any of the benef U.S. beneficiaries any uh, money. And we came up with a new tax provision, which Congress passed. It was knocked back a second time by the WTO, and then finally changed. But the reason I mention this is because the trade dispute process was so well established, the concept of the rule of law, which we've championed, was so uh, important, there was not one dissenting vote on either side to changing a tax provision, which is the most you know, sovereign-related type of provision. It was not just tariffs. This was actually changing our entire tax system, and it was done without any uh, partisanship and, and cooperation. That, that spirit has to be kept because there really is no other process and no other multilateral institution which offers anything like this kind of binding dispute process. Now, on the broader point, I really want to congratulate the, the three authors. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece of work, but it's also an example if I may say, that of why the Peterson Institute is, is in my opinion, head and shoulders uh, the best international economic uh, institute in the world, and this is just one example. Now, on the substance, the sort of bottom line that I draw from this is that, as uh, Jeff and Gary indicated, there's not enough substance on the table to get the U.S. in particular and the EU as well uh, to uh, complete it. I mean, all of the energy, all of the time, all of the political resources have gone into uh, the agricultural talks. And our manufacturing sectors and our service sectors, as time went on, they, they I think, doubted it to begin with just with the title of the talks and the goal of the talks. But as they saw all the energy dissipate from any areas where they would gain anything, the normal constituency pushing the administration, and by the way, a Republican administration initially, which would have been more willing to move, uh, that, that political pressure simply never occurred. And you can see by the figures which uh, dramatize this perhaps the, the reason. A third point is that um, I've known, as I think many of us have, Pascal Lamy, he's, I think, one of the ablest international uh, public servants in the world. I've known him from the days I was ambassador to the EU and he was the chef de cabinet to Jacques Delors. It, it, to me, speaks volumes that someone as able and, I think, courageous as Pascal never put a package on the table himself. There was never a chairman's package. I mean, I talked to him, I'm sure many of us did, and said, for God's sake, put something on the table. <laughs> yes, there's a risk, but just try to get the system to move because it's not operating now. It was never done. It was never the right time, and it's still not been done. That, to me, speaks volumes about where he saw the uh, countries being and the, and the lack of, of progress. I still think it would have been useful, but it certainly wasn't done. Next is that, that what we're seeing here is part of a broader system of, uh, of sort of 
arteriosclerosis when it comes to the trade system. We've had three bilateral trade agreements which have been negotiated, and we talk about the President's goal of uh, doubling and exports and, and fabulous here. These are countries which already have access to our market far greater than we to theirs. It's a sort of win-win situation. And yet, even on these, certainly two of the three, quite simple uh, trade talks bilateral, we can't get that done. So it's all part of a feeling that trade just has slipped off the agenda. It was mentioned uh, that uh, in the op-ed article that, that, that Tim and Larry did, that trade was not mentioned, and for good reason, because at the most recent 2009 G20, there was a specific pledge to complete the Doha round in 2010. A specific pledge, which has produced absolutely no movement whatsoever, and it would therefore be embarrassing to remind people of that. And I suspect that what will happen is that at Toronto, there'll be another pledge to complete it in 2011, and we can reconvene uh, and uh, Fred will give us a good meal and we'll reconvene in 2011 and see how far we've come then. But really, this is not a laughing matter because it impugns the commitments, the solemn commitments that G20 countries are making. If you're not prepared to do it, don't make a commitment. Just talk about the fact that it would be a nice thing to do. Uh, and it, it really does impugn other pledges made in other areas. A couple of other uh, points. Um, U.S. leadership is essential to get this uh, ship moving. Um, it has to come, and if it doesn't come from the U.S., it won't come. And at least right now, that's the current situation. And that, therefore, throws open the question, which, for good reason, uh, Jeff and and, and, and Gary and, and Wan Fong didn't want to tackle and shouldn't have. And that is, is there a future to the multilateral trade system as we know it? Is the consensus rule now simply an impossibility given the divergences which exist in the economic world uh, and having negotiated uh, the uh, Kyoto Protocols and uh, Dan Espy was here. We did a, uh, a panel in New York yesterday on, on uh, the Climate Change Treaty. We simply see that on these key issues, the divergences of interest in countries is so significant. Frank Loy, you lived through it as well, uh, that it, it, to trying to come to a consensus with all countries uh, on the same line is increasingly difficult. So the question is, can you keep the baby and the bathwater without losing sort of both? Can you keep the multilateral structure, the rules-based structure, the disciplines which come from being in the system, hopefully getting Russia and others in, uh, and still move away from this constipated process? Nine years. I mean, suppose we were to make an incremental package and everybody exhausted themselves and we took what was on the table. How many more years would it be before we got to the next round, to even start the next round? I mean, we may be on Mars by that time. <laughs> so I think we really have to think long and hard about it. And, and just two thoughts. One is... Uh, to do the kind of sectoral agreements we did in the Clinton administration. This is suggested here, but perhaps Jeff and Gary, and uh, maybe not as a topping off exercise, but as things in and of themselves to do. Let's take sectors like chemicals, maybe government procurement, IT, and the like, where we can possibly make progress. Do it under a WTO framework and just break it off from this Doha round, which is just, you know, bailing water every second. And second, and more boldly, something that we tackled, if you'll excuse me for mentioning this, Fred, in the Atlantic Council, when I co-chaired a trade panel with Greg Aldonis 
a couple of years ago in which many of your colleagues, I think Jeff and, and Gary both participated, and we, we actually talked about perhaps some kind of coalition of the willing countries within the WTO, multilateral, cross-sectoral, in which you basically challenge the consensus rule by getting countries to agree to deeper cuts if they're, if they're willing to do it in, in a smaller group. And perhaps the way you deal with the MFN issue is you simply exclude key products from those countries that don't play. But, I mean, I think that the real challenge now, Fred, uh, is, is to take all of us and to, to, you know, maybe we just need to get away from the ritualistic incantation uh, about uh, the multilateral process, uh, not to give up on it, but to think of new structures and uh, new arithmetic, new geometry, uh, because this system as we know it doesn't work anymore. We can't, I mean, again, even if miraculously, at Toronto, they all said, let's just take everything that's on a table, we'll agree and wrap it up, which we, of course, know won't happen. Again, where would we be and how long would it take to revive the next round to get services and things included? So, you know, maybe we break services off and do something separate, but we need to really start thinking creatively and uh, out of the envelope if we're going to save this system. Thank you, Stu. Clayton. <coughs> Uh, well, there have been a lot of good things said already, and I'll try not to duplicate those. Uh, Stu, you're going to get a lot of invitations uh, to this uh, facility since you're saying such great things about Fred. Uh, so the rest of us better do that, too, so we get a lot of free lunches, huh, Carla? Uh, no, uh, the Peterson Institute is a fantastic institute, and I think we all agree with that. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, my compliments, too, to... Uh, uh, all of the folks who worked on this, uh, this is a really good piece of work. Uh, and it's a treasure trove of good data. Uh, so everybody sitting in this room uh, ought to be sure to take those, th those books home and read them uh, and add them to your libraries because that's, uh, this is a, a really fine, fine work product uh, that these folks have uh, produced for all, all of us. Uh, secondly, just a couple of immediate observations. First, uh, um, there have been so many tactical errors that have been made uh, in the Doha round going all the way back to Seattle before it was even launched uh, that they're just too numerous to mention. They've been made by lots of delegations, including uh, uh, the U.S. And it's, it's just uh, a shame that that has happened because uh, that's why we're here eight years later with not much uh, uh, to talk about. Uh, it's not a uh, performance that's going to win anybody any gold stars uh, over the last eight years. But we can't go back and change any of that. Uh, we've got to uh, go from where we are today and see what we can do uh, with the mess that's been uh, created. So that's why we're here today talking about this. Uh, secondly, I, I just want to share a couple of uh, 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 Carlos' observations about the fact that the U.S. needs to set a better example uh, to the world. I mean, we have no excuses for the way we've handled the uh, cotton situation. Uh, and we have no excuses for the way we've handled zeroing. I think our performance in both of those, uh, both those instances is just absolutely shameful. Uh, and insofar as the poorest of the poor countries are concerned, Carla, I thought we... Uh, we should have gotten rid of uh, every duty that applies to every product in those countries 20 years ago already. And here it is, we're now, now with commitments up to 96 burden or 97%, but why the heck we can't get the other 3% is just mind boggling uh, to me. You know, it doesn't take a lot of political courage uh, to get from 97% up to 100%, but we still seem not to have been able to get there. Now, uh, on a little more positive uh, uh, side of this, let me make a couple of other points. There are a couple of things that have happened uh, in this round uh, that are really good uh, and that we ought to capture and make sure that uh, we do not, uh, uh, in the end, lose them. One that hasn't had any mention here today is the uh, uh, tentative commitment to phase out all agricultural export subsidies. 
Uh, that is a significant, significant uh, commitment, uh, primarily by the European Union, of course, but also by the U.S. as well. One reason that's incredibly significant to the developing countries uh, who want to wake up and uh, pay attention is that both the European Union and the U.S. began to use the export subsidies again uh, not too terribly long ago because of the recession. Uh, so if you don't get a commitment uh, on the part of everybody to get rid of these darn things, they are going to be back. Uh, and they were our highest priority in the Uruguay round just to get the blame things on the agenda and get some commitments to discipline them. Now we've gone beyond that to where we have tentative commitments to get rid of them for forever, uh, and we risk losing all of that for the benefit of the entire world if this exercise goes down the tubes. That's number one. Uh, a very major achievement in this round that has not been sufficiently recognized by anybody. Uh, the second one is trade facilitation, and I was so glad, uh, you know, Jeff and Gary, that you gave considerable attention to that issue in, uh, uh, in your paper. In my view, that is the hidden jewel of the Doha round. Uh, it seems like in all rounds we have something that turns out to be a jewel that we don't really anticipate. Uh, Carla, I think the jewel in the Uruguay round was the sanitary phytosanitary agreement, uh, which calls for uh, you know, scientific standards to be used in issues like food safety. That was an incredible achievement in the Uruguay round that nobody paid much attention to at the time. But boy, does it sound valuable today uh, when we have food safety uh, uh, controversies uh, and combat uh, all over the world. Well, that, um, I think the uh, jewel that's in, for, in front of us right now is trade facilitation, and we should not lose that. Uh, I wish we'd do it as an early harvest. It's a little hard to have an early harvest eight years into a negotiation, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be delighted if this were an early harvest in the Doha round. It might be the only harvest in the Doha round uh, before we're through, and if necessary, uh, you know, I, I'm like used to, I'd uh, jerk it out and do it uh, uh, separately if necessary just to get it done. Uh, because uh, clearly all of the things that are being talked about in trade facilitation are immensely beneficial to everybody. I mean, this is not a, uh, uh, a negotiation for all practical purposes. This is just getting it right uh, and getting it right uh, everywhere throughout the world. And the, uh, the listing of suggestions uh, for improving this process, uh, which is encompassed in this book, and you can read them, uh, is extensive and very, very impressive indeed. So, uh, you know, let's not forget trade uh, facilitation. Uh, uh, so what, what do you do? Uh, uh, well, I think you do try to finish up the Uruguay or, or the Doha round. Uh, I don't think you abandon it. Uh, because I think there's a, a really high price to pay for abandonment that has already been discussed by Carla uh, and Stu. The hard uh, part of this, of course, is figuring out how the heck you make it happen. Uh, and I think, uh, 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 Gary and Jeff, you've pointed the way. We don't have to do, we the world, don't have to do a whole lot more uh, to make this a, a worthwhile exercise, to bring it through to a successful conclusion, uh, and have it be something that people can uh, take pride in. Um, I don't know that, we're, that there are going to be major changes in either agriculture or NAMA before we're through. There ought to be a little something there uh, on the part of everybody, but uh, you know, that's going to get all bogged down in sensitive and, uh, uh, and special products and, uh, and these kinds of issues. So I don't look for major advancements to come al uh, along in either agriculture or NAMA. You know, we've, we've gone around circle in circles on both those issues for eight years, and I just don't see them uh, improving a lot uh, the rest of the way. But what Gary and Jeff have pointed out is, is that there are a few other things you can do that are pretty worthwhile, and we've already talked about uh, trade facilitation. But the other one that clearly would be very, very beneficial is services. Uh, where fundamentally nothing has happened so far. Uh, and that's, that's just inexcusable. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of good things that can be done in services on the part of everybody, 
And uh, as, Ga as uh, Gary suggested in his presentation, for heaven's sakes, uh, that's where much of the action is in uh, international economic activity today in both developed and developing countries. So the fact that we've been sitting on our tails on services for about eight years, uh, waiting for good things to happen in, in agriculture in NAMA is just abominable. So what people need to do is put that aside for and for heaven's sakes, go to work in the services area. And as, as these folks have pointed out, even if you had uh, a, what modest 10% improvements, however you define that 10%, uh, that would make a very significant contribution to, to the Doha round. And then finally you get, Stu, as you suggested, uh, to the question of sectoral agreements. There's where Frank Vargo comes in. And, uh, uh, and uh, Frank's right and, uh, and you're right. There are some areas here where, uh, where there is a lot of potential benefits, maybe not to all 170 countries or whatever it is today in the WTO membership, but a heck of a lot of those countries that probably have 90 or 95 uh, percent of the trade. So let's capture some of those. Uh, and uh, Gary and Jeff have laid out uh, three major areas where very significant achievements can uh, can occur. Now I think, uh, uh, Fred, we, we ought to try to do those in the uh, in the Doha round first. Uh, and if we can uh, make them a part of the package, as these fellows have suggested, and try to bring the Doha round to a successful conclusion. If we can't, though. Uh, I agree with Stu. Let's pull them out and do them separately uh, because that's uh, feasible as well. Now, just to wrap up, uh, two points. One, uh, it, it will require U.S. leadership uh, to get this done, um, but it requires more than U.S. leadership. Uh, it requires leadership out of some other people as well. Uh, this is not going to happen between now and the election here in the U.S., so you can write off 2010. We're not going to conclude the Doha round in 2010. The real issue is whether it could be concluded in 2011, and the answer is it could. Uh, uh, if people will just begin to demonstrate some leadership and some creativity uh, and, uh, and begin to show some stripes. You know, I've said in speeches, Carla, uh, three, four years ago, uh, the, the big problem in the Doha round is that everybody's holding their cards close to their vest. Nobody wants to show their cards. Well, now it's eight years have passed, uh, and then nobody's still showing their cards. Well, I think it's about time to say enough of that. Uh, and it doesn't do any good just to pass resolutions by the chiefs of state, because obviously they don't mean a thing. Uh, any instruction that's going down to their trade ministers is going nowhere, and it's going nowhere in Geneva. Uh, so the fact is, I think you've got to get some leadership from some of the key players. To me, and you can name all the uh, you wish in the list, but I think if you had the U.S., the European community, China, India, and Brazil, those five, you ought to put them in a room and say, don't come out until you figure out a way to make the Doha round a, a success in the year 2011, and they could easily do it if they just set their minds to it. Now, the negative motivation of that, and this is my last point, is that it seems, as Stu was indicating, if we can't get this job done, there is a, uh, you know, it's hard to visualize a good future for the multilateral system. What we're going to do then is, uh, uh, is depend on uh, uh, free trade negotiations uh, with the, the, uh, the well-known shortcomings in terms of their di inherently discriminatory nature, uh, the fact that those on the inside benefit much more than those on the outside, uh, and the fact that they become increasingly complex, which means that the small exporting entities of the world in all countries end up being the losers. The big guys can figure out uh, through uh, sophisticated software how to get this done, so the little guys lose. And when you're talking about free trade negotiations in, uh, in either a bilateral or a plurilateral sense, uh, the big countries win, the little countries uh, typically lose too, and I would hope the developing countries will begin to wake up pretty soon and figure out that maybe they ought to put more, some reliance on them making the multilateral system work and not get caught in a situation where they're bound to be the losers. Fred? Clayton, thank you. Uh, 
before I open it up, let me just ask you, Clayton, one follow-up question, keeping in mind that you were Secretary of Agriculture, of course, as well as USTR. You've called for leadership by the major countries. Some people have suggested that to break that logjam you describe, where everybody holds cards close to vest, what's needed is for the U.S. to come forward with a, an additional offer to reduce its own agricultural subsidies that that would be the single most likely step to break the logjam, elicit some improved market access commitments from the big uh, emerging markets, uh, and thereby get the round back in track. Uh, what's your response to that, both in terms of substance and the way it would play in the domestic politics here? Okay. That's a geopolitical economic question, obviously, and the answer, Fred, is it isn't going to happen. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and the reason for that is, well, first, the U.S. is not going to negotiate with itself on agriculture. Uh, uh, but secondly, uh, the whole U.S. agriculture community is united in feeling that the, uh, uh, the developing countries of the world, which is uh, particularly in Asia, which is where a lot of the potential for increased agricultural trade exists, I really haven't stepped up uh, to bat yet in this exercise. They've agreed to take a lot of water out of their uh, 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 their agricultural duties, and and, uh, and Gary and Jeff have pointed out that that's important. Uh, but boy, there is not much uh, in the way of real market access. And I just don't think you can go out to my home state of Nebraska and say to a wheat farmer. Uh, uh, you know, isn't it wonderful that the that all of these countries have taken a lot of water out of their tariffs? And uh, he says, does that mean I'm going to uh, be able to export more wheat? Well, no, but you should feel good that uh, uh, that the water is going. Um, I, I just don't think that sells. And uh, to me, uh, those countries are going to have to step up, show some of those cards in willing uh, in willingness to. Uh, uh, in some cases, take out more water. In, in other cases, uh, go beyond that, um, uh, providing real market access and, and other things to at least, at least generate some interest on the part of the U.S. agriculture community. I do not think that Ambassador Kirk is going to be able to uh, uh, make any commitments like that uh, uh, anytime soon. The other factor there, Fred, that I just mentioned very quickly is that you have the chairman of the House Agriculture Committee doing uh, – uh, hearings already on the on our next farm bill, uh, and look and he's looking for some pretty darn creative ideas that may well change our agricultural policy in a fairly significant way. Uh, that being the case, we need to keep that uh, potential in mind for this exercise, uh, because with the, the the pace at which the Doha round has been pers been uh, underway. Uh, we might well have a new farm bill before we conclude the Doha round, in which case uh, those um, new and creative uh, farm policy uh, ideas might well be incorporated in the Doha round, and I think that would be uh, you know, potentially good news uh, for this negotiation. So there's a little question of timing there that, that might turn out to be totally a, a, an unexpected uh, potential benefit. Stu? Yeah, I'd like to add two points. Uh, I certainly agree with Clayton on the politics, but I think that there is one other factor, uh, Clayton, in addition to the, the new ag bill that one should consider that uh, while a unilateral offer may not be possible, it may end up being a practical way out. And that is, if we are serious about starting our deficit reduction uh, effort for fiscal year uh, 2012, that is for the budget coming up, in January, February, which I think we will have to be. This is obviously one area where we will have to put something on the table and for, for deficit reduction purposes, and we can maybe capture some of the political benefit of that in the trade area because we'll have to do this for deficit reduction. The second point I, I wanted to make is on, on Clayton's uh, point about where we go without a multilateral uh, agreement is that uh, we clearly will be seeing more slicing and dicing of the world in terms of bilateral and regional agreements. But may I say that it's not just the small countries that may be hurt by this. Because if you assume that Asia is the big growth market for the United States in exports, 
And you see that we are being cut out of Asia by regional agreements, China, ASEAN, et cetera. Uh, and we're very tepid players in the TPP process. Then it's not just the small countries. We ourselves, if we don't see the multilateral system being an alternative, will find out that Asia goes its own way and that we, the United States, are being blocked uh, or impeded uh, from what will be the biggest growth market in the next uh, uh, 20 to 25 years. Yes, Carla. I, I agree with Stu that uh, if you're talking to a group of farmers in Nebraska, you're going to have to sell this more broadly because what's on the plate is not of itself going to be a sufficient market opening on day one. But we have to make our fiscal uh, deficit is too high. And that's going to have to be addressed as we move forward. And we ought to remind people that uh, we can do well by doing good. Uh, that Asian market that Stu uh, refers to is huge. China this week just took two uh, shiploads of corn, yellow corn, first time. Food security is going to be a real problem going forward. And we could, as we did after World War II, help create markets and thereby have opportunities for the future. And so I think this really is a political issue. It's po selling the uh, multilateral system and, and where its shortcomings are and how we can fix them is really to the benefit of overall prosperity for America. Okay, floor is open for comments, questions, and uh, otherwise uh, observations. Uh, we've, we've taken Frank Vargo's name in vain a few times, so Frank gets pride of place for first comment. Uh, please, uh, we've got traveling mics, we've got a standing mic. Introduce yourself and uh, tell where you're from and then fire away. Thank you. Uh, Frank Vargo with the NAM. And first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Jeff, Gary, and the team for a really fantastic study. We're very pleased, not surprised, but very pleased that you've corroborated what we've been saying for a number of years now, that there just is not enough out of the uh, tariff formulas. Now, as I, I look at your results uh, for NAMA worldwide, I think they were about a gain of 50 billion, 60 billion, something like that, for all countries. And we have to put this in perspective because Today, uh, world exports of manufactured goods are $10 trillion, so we're talking about a half of 1% gain, which, which is not a lot. And, and worse than that, it, it won't happen immediately. I think you'll agree that because the, the cuts take place from bound rates and they take place in 10 annual equal stages, it takes about nine years for Brazil and India and others to get their bound rates down to where their applied rates are now. So for basically eight, nine years, we get zip, and in the uh, ninth or tenth year, we get the seven billion dollars that you're talking about. Now, uh, contrast that with what the International Trade Commission has said would result from the three pending trade agreements of Colombia, Panama, and Korea. We could pick up 12 billion dollars next year. Now, this is not an argument for saying we shouldn't do the Doha round. We want that, and the NAM has always wanted it. But it is an argument for saying how silly it is that we are not moving forward to provide ourselves the benefits that could come from these FTAs. But make no mistake, and Stu said, well, business wasn't really supporting the Doha round. For NAM, that's not so. We really have been pushing hard from the beginning. We're particularly fond of NAMA, and why not? It's named after us, NAMA. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we are not discouraged by the fact that uh, the round has gone so long because of the uh, NAM theorem, which is Kennedy round took four years. Tokyo, six. Uruguay, eight. What's the next number in the progression of four, six, eight? It's 10. Add it to 2001, and voila, the round is going to come to a conclusion in 2011. And we believe that's possible. The fault line is not in agriculture. I don't think that we're that far apart in agriculture. Farm Bureau, I don't think will differ, but they'll speak for themselves. The fault line is in NAMA. We've always known it has to be sectorals, and Stu is exactly right that uh, you know if we can do them standalone or uh, bunch them together, but th there will be enough gain there for us, enough balance, and we're not the only ones who would gain. You know, China will gain, Brazil, everybody will gain from the sectorals if we can have them. It's not that hard. 
This round is particularly important because it's the first one where the advanced developing countries, and China is the world's largest exporter now, are being told, you have to pony up. You have to open up your markets. And we talk about leadership. The dynamic really changed, I think, at the Geneva Ministerial in December. Before that, the strategy was lean enough on the U.S. and they'll, they'll take what's on the table. And Ambassador Kirk, uh, Ambassador Punk have made a plain, that's not going to happen, folks. So if you want the dough around, you've got to do more. And I still believe it's doable and it's worth going after. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Guy? Thank you. Guy Erb from FDI Consulting. Uh, given the barriers and the resistance that you've all mentioned and the breakdown around the edges that's implicit in Stu's comments and some of Carly Hills' comments as well, uh, and a final point, from some of your tables, Gary and Jeff, what emerged to me was the disparities of gains between India, Brazil, and China, with Brazil and India on one hand and China on the other. Why would Brazil and India support the package that you outlined? So getting them in a room, I think, is not going to be the solution. There, something more has to be done. And I'm going to suggest that for your next book, uh, instead of the carrot, as you've held out in this, uh, try the stick and show people what would happen if indeed the brown breaks down and the WTA, WTO breaks, breaks down as well. Other comments or observations? Okay, if not, let me just see if Gary and or Jeff want to have a quick response to Guy or any final remarks, and then we'll bring to a close. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. I especially want to thank uh, Carla and <coughs> Stu and uh, Clayton for, for uh, their astute comments. Uh, just a quick uh, response to um, the guy. Well, I think it is being recognized on trade as on currency that um, other emerging countries don't have the same interests as China. It's coming a little bit slowly, but it is coming. Uh, I, I think it was detected in that uh, in one of those last meetings and certainly in the, I think, in Geneva circles. But are they willing to um, put up pressure on China? Well, probably not yet. They still see uh, sort of a coalition in China's working as strongly as it can behind the scenes to uh, foster that coalition. But I think China badly mistakes its commercial interests. And Peter Sutherland gave a very good uh, lecture, the Jan Tumler honorary lecture, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, where he said, the time has come that unless China steps up and assumes its responsibilities, uh, which means giving, in reciprocity terms, much more than it's taking, this multilateral system is not going to survive. And uh, so uh, hopefully the Chinese will read that lecture. That's why we need a G2. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Jeff, you get the final word. Well, uh, there, there are a couple of points. First, uh, there is an underestimation of the systemic cost of failure. And uh, I think the Brazilians understand it better than the others. Uh, and they know that they will be the big losers if this round fails, because what's on the table is not going to be harvested. Uh, much less the additional gains that you can see that they would accrue, uh, particularly in the U.S. and European markets. So uh, it's interesting that Brazil has been trying to find a way to bridge the gap so uh, they don't end up being, being the big losers in this party. Uh, India as well, now that it has a government that has a stronger majority, has more flexibility across many areas of the Doha agenda. Uh, and that needs to be tested now. Uh, before, it was just subsistence farmers forget about it. Uh, and uh, now there is a much more uh, broad, broad uh, based and sophisticated Indian approach to the negotiations, which, which should be tested. Uh, uh, and finally, I think the US has to be tested and uh, has to show the leadership. And I would disagree just a little bit with what, 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 what Clayton said about, uh, uh, about uh, the U.S. Uh, negotiating with itself uh, on agriculture. I, 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 I can't uh, dispute his assessment of the, of, of the politics. Uh, uh, he, I look to him for guidance on this all the time. But when one 
thinks about a U.S. offer on agricultural subsidies, what we are doing right now would be reducing the water in our tariff bindings, not taking money out of the pockets of far U.S. farmers, because the level of our uh, subsidy uh, disbursements is well below the maximum allowed in, in the WTO. Now, there's a question on the distribution of those subsidies, which the negotiators will have to work out. And there's a question about how, if we cut the, uh, reduce the level of the binding over a period of five years, how that would affect the structure of existing U.S. farm programs. And indeed, that's why the point that Clayton made about looking at uh, ideas on revisions to the Farm Bill uh, could be an inspiration for negotiators as they move into, into 2011. I think that's a way to move forward, and it wouldn't be negotiating with ourselves. I said this in Geneva a few months ago. I said if the U.S. officials put a uh, an offer on the table and it wasn't reciprocated, that offer would be worthless because it would be dead on arrival if you tried to cash it in in the Congress. And uh, that's an advantage U.S. negotiators have. They should take the initiative as we did back in the Tokyo round, put an offer on the table and negotiate until it's, it's, the package is acceptable enough that will pass political muster in the United States and elsewhere. That's what we hope uh, will come out of some of the ideas uh, from our book and hopefully provide some grist for the negotiators to go back and uh, 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 produce some real results starting later this year and hopefully reaching fruition in 2011. Jeff, thank you. Many thanks to Gary, Jeff, and the team. I see Matt Adler's here. Matt, great to see you. <laughs> Terrific job. Thanks to Carla, Stu Clayton for broadening our discussion, letting us again partake of their wisdom. Thanks to all of you for coming. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.